In this short video, what we want to do is generalize the formula that we derived for the 3 by 3 determinant to an n by n matrix. And then we'll use that formula not to compute the determinant, because it's going to be really difficult using the formula, but the formula will help us determine some important properties of the determinant. So let's just remember how we came up with the uh, formula for the 3 by 3 determinant. We had six terms, because 3 factorial is 6. Three of the terms have positive coefficients, and three have negative coefficients. Each term is expressed as the product of three factors. So three numbers are multiplied together to form one term, and we have six terms all together, and the sum of those six terms is the de determinant. Now each factor, each of those numbers that are being multiplied together, is one of the entries from the matrix A. If we write the entries with double subscript, where the first subscript tells us the row position and the second subscript tells us the column position, uh, then uh, we can see that uh, any factor in any one of the six terms consists of entries which all come from different rows and different columns. So this table is actually pretty interesting. You can uh, observe some, some interesting patterns. Uh, for example, if I were to take a line, yeah, let me use a different color, draw that line right through the middle. And if I were to reflect the boxes, not the entries, but the boxes, uh, across that line, so the middle box would just stay where it is, and this bottom box would come to the top, and the top box would come to the bottom, you can see that the box positions are the mirror images uh, in the bottom, the, in the bottom row, the box positions are the mirror images of the top. So this one comes down to the bottom, this one goes up to the top, this one goes to the bottom, this one goes to the top. There's all kinds of interesting patterns that you can see here. And um, so what this means is that if we choose to arrange the factors so that the row indices are ascending, the row indices are always going 1, 2, 3, then the column indices are a permutation of those three numbers. And there are six permutations, so that's how we get six terms. And if the permutation is even, remember that means it has an even number of inversions, then the coefficient is positive. And on the other hand, if the permutation is odd, the coefficient is negative. So now, what would this mean for an n by n matrix? We would have n factorial terms. That's a lot of terms. So this is not an efficient way uh, to compute uh, the determinant of a general matrix. So we're not interested in computing the value, we're interested in its properties. So each one of the terms is going to have n factors, and those factors are entries in the matrix A, and in a given term, each factor will come from a different row and a different column. So each term has a representative from each row and a representative from each column. Uh, we can arrange the factors so that the row indices are in ascending order, which means that the column indices would just be a permutation of the numbers from 1 to n. And again, since there's n factorial permutations, there's going to be n factorial terms. And we'll keep the same uh, idea that if the permutation is even, then the coefficient is going to be positive, while if the permutation is odd, the coefficient is negative. So if we put all those ideas together, we can actually write down a formula. So we're going to have a sum. Remember, there's going to be uh, n factorial terms. And so instead of writing an index from 1 to n factorial, what we're going to do is use an index set. 
In this case, the index set is the set of all permutations. We know there's n factorial of them. And so the idea is we're going to choose uh, or we're going to order these permutations in some way. It doesn't really matter uh, because we're adding them. So, and we're going to take the sign into effect. So we'll order them in some way. We'll pick one. We'll calculate its sign. And then we'll get a term from that permutation because we know the row indices are ascending and the column indices come from the permutation. And then we would pick our next sigma, our next permutation, and then that would give us our second term. We'd add it to the first term that we got, and so on. We would continue through all of the permutations, and then that would give us the value of the determinant. Now, nobody's making a claim that this is a good way to compute the determinant, even for a small matrix. But it does help us understand some important properties of the determinant. Let's go through some of those. All right. Uh, the key idea, again, and we're going to state this in three different ways. In any term, each factor comes from a different row and a different column. And each term contains a unique representative from each row and each column. So if there's a particular property of a row or a column, that property will be in every single term. And each term contains a factor then, which is an entry from every row and an entry from every column. And that's going to help us with the following idea. What if A had a row of zeros? So since each term contains a factor from every row, that means each term would contain a factor from the row of zeros. So each term has a zero factor. And if you multiply zero times anything, you're going to get zero. In fact, all of the terms then are going to be zero. And you add them up, you still get zero, meaning the determinant must be zero. And so what have we just found? We found that if A has a row of zeros, then the determinant of A is zero. Now, early on, we made the statement without giving any justification that if a matrix is invertible, uh, its determinant cannot be zero. And on the other hand, if a matrix is not invertible, its determinant must be zero. So if we accept that as a fact, then we've got reinforcement right here because we know that if a matrix has a row of zeros, if a square matrix has a row of zeros, it can't be invertible. And so it makes sense that its determinant must be 0. So what if A has two identical rows? So let's start by thinking about this in the 3 by 3 case. So here are all six terms with their appropriate signs for the determinant of A. Now, let's just suppose that the first two rows are identical. All right, it really wouldn't matter which two rows we choose, so let's choose the first two rows to be identical. So in other words, the second row is exactly the same as the first. So A21 is the same as A11, A22 is the same as A12, A23 is the same as A13. And so now in my formula, I'm going to replace A22 with uh, A12. I'm going to replace A23 with A13. And I'll replace A21 with A11. Right? So these uh, have been replaced. Right? So the, all of the terms from the second row then have been replaced with the same, because they're identical, the values from the first row. And now if you look at that carefully with a little color coding to help us, we can see that each term in the first row of this formula has a corresponding term in the second formula, which is the same factors. All right, they're written in a different order. Here I have a11 and a12, then I have a12, a11. In fact, uh, the first two have been swapped. So the order of the first two have been swapped. 
And here's A13, A11, then A11, A13. And then so we have pairs. And one is positive, one is negative. And actually it makes sense that the other one should be negative. Uh, based on our formula, which says that uh, if one has a positive permutation, uh, and if I make a swap in the uh, permutation, then I'm going to change the sign. So it's going to be negative. All right, so now I have pairs of terms. One's positive and one's negative. They have the same factors in each term. So they're going to add up to be 0. And so for at least a 3 by 3 matrix, if A has two identical columns, its determinant is 0. How would we extend this to uh, a general n by n matrix? Well, we have n factorial terms. So we're not going to try to write down all of the terms. What we're going to do is look at one specific term. We're going to call that term t. And the t then has n factors written together. We can write it so we have row ascending order. So the row indices are 1, 2, 3, up to n. And then the column indices are some permutation of 1 to n. Now, some other term in the uh, expression for the determinant or the equation for the determinant is going to have the almost the same uh, product. In fact, it's going to have the same product. The only thing that's going to happen is that uh, I'm going to have um, the first two column indices switched. So instead of having A1, K1, A2, K2, I'm going to have A1, K2, A2, K1. So that's just another term. Because why? Because when I do that switch, um, that is a new permutation of the 1 to n. And um, all of the permutations are represented in the formula for the determinant. So this t prime term is one of the terms that we're adding up to find the value of the determinant. Now, the only difference is a swap, one swap in the first two components, which means that by doing the swap, we change the sign. So if t has a positive term, t prime is going to have a or positive coefficient, t prime will have a negative coefficient, and vice versa. And so they have opposite coefficients. That's going to be important because now, if I replace, so if I assume row 1 and row 2 are identical, so in T prime, instead of having A2 comma K1, since A2, that comes from the second row, and the second row is the same as the first, so A2 comma K1 is the same as A1 K1. And so now look, everything from 3 to n, that stayed the same. And uh, now I have the same two terms just swapped. I'm sorry, same two factors in, in these terms. So these terms, t and t prime, have the exact same factors but opposite signs. And so in the formula, when I add them together, they're going to make 0. And so since every term can be paired in this way, uh, then if we can say that if A has identical rows, its determinant is 0. Well, and of course, uh, before we go on, then of course that makes sense, right? Again, we know that if we have two rows which are identical, then the column vectors are not linearly independent. And uh, that means that the matrix could not be invertible. All right, so what about columns? Is there anything special? We've been focusing on rows, but really there's nothing in the definition that says that we have to focus on rows. We just did it for convenience. And so uh, if I think of a 
term and the determinant, we have chosen, and it's just a choice, to order them so that the factors have row ascending indices. But we could rearrange that the factors so that the column indices are ascending. Now, having the sign of the inverse here is probably not very clear in general. Let's, let's start by looking at an example. Let's consider one term of the 24 terms that are in the determinant formula for, the four by four, for a 4x4 four four matrix. Remember, 4 factorials is 24. So um, to find the column indices for our particular term, we're going to select uh, one permutation, and the permutation is going to be 4, 2, 1, 3. Now, the inverse of that permutation is 3, 2, 4, 1. And we know that the sign of a permutation and its inverse are the same. Uh, so uh, sigma is an even permutation, and so it has a positive sign. And that means sigma inverse is also positive, and we'll also, I mean, it's also even, and we'll also have a positive sign. All right, so here's our term out of the formula for the determinant of a 4 by 4 matrix. So we have the row ascending orders, and then the column indices are 4, 2, 1, 3. That, that's the permutation sigma that we chose. That's one of the 24 terms. But we could also write that same term by just it doesn't matter, I'm multiplying. So I can change the order of the numbers in the multiplication, and the value will not change. And so uh, I'm going to put the uh, terms in column ascending order. So I'm going to put the term, I'm mean, sorry, the factor. I'm going to put the factor that has column index 1 first, and then column index 2, then column index 3, and column index 4. Now look at the row indices. Let's go back for a minute here. And let's go ahead and cut this and put it on the clipboard so we can see it clearly. All right. And now look. So when we did row ascending indices, the column indices were 4, 2, 1, 3. That's our permutation. When I just sort them according to the column indices, look at the row indices, 3, 2, 4, 1. Those are exactly, that's exactly the components of the inverse of sigma. So if you think about it enough, it really does make sense that it should be that way. Um, that uh, if I change, so this is, you know, what does, uh, th this one was in the third position. Well, what does one um, map onto, or what gets um, mapped to uh, one? Um, so let's see here, one, three. Oh, no, that makes sense, yeah maps on to 3. Okay. And that's what I just said. That we, the, now the uh, indices on the, when we write it with column ascending order are the components from sigma inverse. So really when we think about it, that means we could have defined our, the determinant using the same idea about uh, permutations, but just choosing to have the terms written so the factors ha are written with column ascending order. We'll still be adding up the same number of terms. They're still going to have the same sign. The only, thing is we're, the only thing that we're doing is we have chosen to write the factors in each term in such a way that we 
have column ascending indices. Well, what that tells us is that really any statement about the rows of A and its determinant will be true about the columns of A and it, the determinant. So in particular, if A has a column of zeros, then the determinant of A will be zero. If A has two identical columns, then the determinant of A will be zero. And finally, since the transpose of a matrix is found by interchanging the rows and columns, we can say that the determinant of A transpose is the same as the determinant of A. So these are interesting properties, and we'll refer back to this definition uh, to uh, expand upon interesting properties of the determinant. Uh, but what's really missing is some practical ways of computing the value of the determinant, and that's what we're going to learn in the next videos.